this is the plenary session, and I could not think of a, a better uh, leader, officer, and friend than lead a discussion, a fireside chat with two of the most senior uh, acquisition professionals, one in the Navy and one in the Army, as Lieutenant General Williamson. Um, he is now a senior vice president with Lockheed, so he has both senior leadership experience in the acquisition professional as a former military deputy uh, in uh, of assault or uh, assistant secretary of the army for acquisition Log logistics and sustainment and now also a senior leader in industry so i could not think of a better person to lead a fireside chat with senior leaders currently serving as lieutenant general williamson good morning everyone good morning so i i really enjoyed the uh, keynote speaker and I think you're going to find that this is going to dovetail very nicely uh, into that discussion. And, and similar to uh, Dr. Mortlock, I can't think of a, a better group of folks to, to have on a panel. And so I'm, I'm really excited about this discussion. J just kind of 30 seconds about me, because I think um, I'm one of those guys who spent whatever the number of years were, were uh, working acquisition from the Department of Defense side, learning a lot and thinking that I understood what our uh, industrial industry partners were doing. And then after five or six years of running uh, profit and loss, and now as a corporate officer, I'm finding that sometimes our dialogue between the two isn't as great as it, as it should be. And so I'm really looking forward to the insights that are going to be provided by uh, two very senior, very experienced, and very knowledgeable leaders. So a cu couple of thoughts. So there's probably going to be some of you in the room who are going to object to this next comment. Um, my team actually gave me some speaking notes, and I'm not going to use them. <laughs> because as I was uh, as I was sitting here, I was thinking about a couple of things that have happened recently. And I just wanted to share those with you. So, so first of all, where that discomfort I think is going to come from is when I tell you that the acquisition system is not broke. Now there are people that are rolling over in whatever state they're in uh, who are rolling over when I make that statement. But I would make the argument to you and then I'm gonna back it up that the acquisition system that we have in place uh, actually delivers capability. And if you think about some, some fundamentals, right? So how do I get capability to, to the warfighter that allows them to execute their mission and come home safely? How do we protect the taxpayer, right? So each of us wants to make sure that um, our contributions to this government uh, are, are well spent and we're well thought out. Um, and how do we you know, promote things like competition and avoid fraud, those types of things? We have a system that does that. We can argue about the efficiency of that system, but you cannot argue about the effectiveness given the capabilities that we deliver. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a use case. It is uh, a use case, but you know, in my role, so my my longer title is I'm Senior Vice President for Global Business Development, uh, but I'm also the President of Lockheed International. And as a result, I spend a lot of my time with our uh, international customers, and that's at the Minister of Defense head of, uh, head of state level. And just over the last few weeks, and I won't name all of the countries, but over the last few weeks, I've, I've had a number of uh, prime ministers and ministers of defense visiting factories here in the here in the U.S. and you're all familiar with these types of tours where you show them the production line and all of those other things. But at one point, uh, I was standing next to the minister of defense, and and he he wasn't talking directly to me. He was actually speaking out loud to himself, and he had just come out of one of the factory floors, and he said. This is why we buy things from the United States and not from former Soviet bloc or, or Russian. The precision, the reliability, the capabilities that they deliver and the performance 
is why we come to the US. And the reason you come to the US, and I'll take you back to my original thesis, is because we are effective at uh, design, production, and delivery of capabilities. And so my argument is, is, is that my expectation is that leaders have to work within a system that may not necessarily be optimal, but that we, each of us, have a requirement to optimize within that system and to take advantage of the opportunities that it presents us to deliver capabilities faster, smarter, more affordably. So look, there's been a lot of talk about, uh, rightfully so, in fact, you can't go anywhere without people talking to you about the fragility of, of our industrial base and the challenges that we're under. And so my intent is not to spend a, a bunch of time talking about that. I, I suspect it'll come up uh, from uh, our speakers today, but I think it's important for us to understand that we have to look at all aspects of acquisition, not just the design, the program performance, but actual execution that allows us to put capability in the hands of our warfighters to support our national defense objectives to include our international partners. And so what does that landscape look like, not only today, and, and I thought the keynote speaker made a really, really good point, but we have to look at it not just for today and for domestically, but when you look at our national defense strategy, how does that include uh, coalition partners? When you start to look at the development and the production of capability. So what I'd really like for us to focus on during the panel today is, so, so how do we influence that acquisition policy and process that allows us to encourage closer collaboration with our, with our allies and closer collaboration between the department and the people that produce out in industry? How do we provide for the rapid development and delivery of capability. So how do we not stymie the innovation that exists in this nation and outside of the shores of this nation to get capability to warfighters sooner? And then, as we just talked, how do we make sure that we promote an industrial base that has the ability to provide capability today, but also has the ability to surge as we look at the types of threats that exist today, not just in Europe, but also potentially in the Pacific. So to address those questions, we again are, are very lucky to have uh, two outstanding uh, senior leaders. First, uh, Lieutenant General David Bassett, who is the commander of the Defense Contract Management Agency. Uh, I've known General Bassett for years and I'm looking forward to, to his comments. I am not going to do justice to the vast experience uh, that he brings to this discussion. But I would ask that if you get a chance to go to page 32 uh, in your, your abstract and just look at some of his experience, not only, uh, it, it, so I don't want you to just focus on the number of years, but the diversity of experience that he brings across multiple platforms and capabilities. Also joined by Vice Admiral Frank Morley. I, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to him about this. So as an army guy, I've landed on a carrier twice, scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> and I think I'll probably get this wrong, but you have 750 carrier landings? My God. So anyway. Most of them with my eyes closed though. <laughs> So, so one of the things that uh, I think uh, I'm really excited to hear about from uh, the Admiral's experience is not only his operational experience, which is vast uh, commands of, of operational squadrons, but also the international experience that he has brought uh, to the table from his experience at, at NIPO. Uh, I'm, I'm excited that both of you gentlemen could join us. I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to uh, ask Dave if you have any um, introductory comments. 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with everyone here today. Uh, when I heard the topic of today's panel, they said this is the future of Army and Navy acquisition. And then I looked to my left and my right, and I realized this is not the future. <laughs> the future is out in the audience. It's in the Naval Postgraduate sc uh, School students uh, that will be the future of defense acquisition. And so the investment that you're making listening to us talk about you know, acquisition of the past and what it means for the future, uh, I'm grateful to have you here. It's also great to sit another panel with, uh, with Admiral Morley. Uh, I, I actually am not sure I realized until this morning that he was a pilot, which is really rare because usually you can tell if someone is a pilot very early on because they will tell you. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and you know, in DCMA, I've got I've got a lot of great Navy officers. I used to you know think about the Navy in two parts. It was the Black Shoe Navy and the Brown Shoe Navy. Uh, and having been in DCMA, I realized that the strength of the Navy is in their logistics and their supply corps. So for all the supply corps officers out there uh, who have put up with both the Brown Shoe and Black Shoe Navy for many years, God bless you. Uh, it's wonderful to see you today. Um, yeah, hell yeah, best part of the Navy. Uh, that, that wasn't supposed to be my opening remarks, I don't think. Um, so, you know, when we think about so a couple of topics today about, about speed in acquisition, about collaboration with allies, and about what it means to have a healthy industrial base, I think those are the great topics that we really have to focus on to help drive things forward. Uh, and having now spent three years as the DCMA director, uh, I've gotten to see what happens after contracts are awarded. Uh, when, when the performance of delivering defense capability is largely constrained only by industry's ability, uh, to get to dialed in production, to get to a point of production at scale that Dr. LaPlante talks about. And so sometimes when I'm talking to young acquisition officers and some that are not so young, I say, imagine for a minute that there were no DOD 5000 process at all. Okay, usually I get applause with that line. Um, but imagine there was no process at all. Uh, I, I sometimes call it at back acquisition, no rules, just right. Uh, and all you had to do was the activities necessary to deliver today's advanced capabilities. You still have to design things and you have to do enough to get to a level of design that supports modern manufacturing. That means drawings for parts. That means mature designs that aren't gonna change when you go facilitize to deliver them. You've gotta design things, you have to manufacture at scale. You have to test to make sure that it does what you think it's gonna do and that you're delivering a meaningful capability. You have to field things and you have to sustain things. And so if we do this acquisition thing right, uh, we're gonna run programs that are not constrained by a contracting process or by a set of milestones that we drag program managers through in the Pentagon. And that has been delightful in my experience. Uh, but we're gonna be constrained by the activities. And the reality is, is that delivering today's highly complex capabilities, those activities, they take a while. It takes a while to build the tooling, to put the supply chain in place, to get the software finalized, to get the drawings in place. Those activities, even if DOD weren't looking, would take the defense industry a significant amount of time to deliver new capabilities. And so I think sometimes uh, as, a, as an institution, people who are not deeply uh, steeped in acquisition uh, are, are often told, well, let's bring some people in that have, that have no idea, that don't do this professionally, and we'll bring someone in from the outside so they can really reform it. And I'm here to tell you today that the path to innovation in acquisition isn't in people that are less familiar. It's with a team of trusted professionals that understand how to deliver capability and deliver it to our war fighters. No one that is unfamiliar with something has ever innovated it. And so it's gonna be the professionals. It's gonna be the people dedicated to our professional craft uh, that make a real difference. And so we're gonna get contracting off the critical path. We're gonna get acquisition bureaucracy off the critical path. Uh, and we're gonna to get to that point of dialed in production. And so, you know, to, to the earlier comments around test, I think, um, if you look at what our adversaries are capable of doing, it is frequently because they were, are willing to live with less than perfect solutions while they learn, right? And so our whole system is not really designed to do that. Uh, it's designed to, 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 to stretch for very exquisite requirements, and it's designed to test for nearly perfect knowledge. Uh, and I think if we're going to go faster, uh, we're going to have to learn to deal with some of the ambiguity of maybe not knowing quite as much 
or fielding a capability that we know isn't perfect. And I think we have to shift our culture to test to understand capabilities and limitations more so than what I think is an often subjective standard of suitability and effectiveness. And I, a couple of examples of that, uh, one is reliability. Uh, clearly, with a, an airplane, it has to be highly reliable because if it's not, it drops out of the sky. Um, the things that I've managed don't normally drop out of the sky, tanks and trucks and all those other things. And so we would get a reliability requirement from our user that said it has to be X number of thousand miles between failure. And then we would test to that as a KPP and we'd say, if it doesn't meet that, we don't want it. So it, it's got to be at least 2,000 miles between system abort. Well, what if it's 1900? Would you still take it? I bet you would, right? And so we, we treat that requirement like it's sacred instead of understanding the capabilities and limitations and then the business case around whether that's something we should deliver and improve over time or whether we should hold it in development or keep it in some reliability test cycle until it meets those thresholds. And so uh, I think that shift away from, and I know this is uh, you know challenging some norms, away from suitable and effective because they were inherently subjective and towards the idea of really deeply understanding capabilities and limitations to inform that decision of what you put in the hands of our warfighters. I think it's also important to realize that these systems don't exist in isolation. Uh, they have to work with the other things that are out there. So when we think about what's holding back the insertion of technology, it's not often that the technology itself isn't mature, it's that it has to work with everything else that's in the field. We don't just go take out every other radio because we're going to field a new one or a mission command system that's going to replace the entire stack of software. It's got to work together. And so uh, back a few years ago, five years ago-ish, uh, uh, I was working with the Army's tactical network as the PEO, and we came up with uh, around a two-year window to deliver capability sets. And within that two-year window, we had to be able to finalize the design, select technologies. It gave us on-ramps and off-ramps for technology and innovation, but it created enough time to make sure that we could make sure it worked with everything else within the tactical network space. And when you looked at the activities, two years was about as fast as you could go to have a rigorously testable solution that we thought you could feel good putting in the hands of soldiers, even for a limited number of brigades. Um, today, uh, the Army is revisiting the two-year window, and they want to go faster. And so my challenge is going to be, let's understand what was in the schedule, what the activities were, and you're not going to go faster simply by demanding that it go faster. You're going to go faster by selecting a different subset of integration activities, and you're going to do less, and you're going to field it with less confidence. And we should be confident that that faster delivery cycle actually is going to deliver a better capability. Uh, we didn't arrive at two years very lightly, right? It was it was a balance of rigor and and innovation, and and being able to pull those things together. And so that those on ramps and off ramps for technology are really important. If you have no developmental programs because everything has to be delivered rapidly, you will have limited opportunities to transfer that technology. Um, so the last thing I'll talk about is about this notion of innovation and how we really, I think you have to fund for that over time. Uh, when, I, when I was the program manager for the JLTV program, we had to make some really unrealistic assumptions about technology insertion. And the assumption we made was that we were gonna create a design and pretty much stick with it. Because the minute I started to inject technology, I had to model the cost of that technology insertion and the potential increase in the cost of the end item. And when we were taking that program through its milestones, and this has been true of all the big programs I've ever run, we were really answering only two questions in the Pentagon, was could the Army afford to buy it, and could the Army afford to sustain it? And if I acknowledged the technology insertion, like in a real way in our cost model, it would be less affordable and unlikely to make it into production at all. And so, uh, you know, this past week, I was up in Seattle for a, a summit on the KC-46, and it was like this blinding flash of the obvious that we have to resource technology insertion over time. So the KC-46 was designed around 2008, 2009. Uh, it was awarded in 2011. And so if you look at the technology that was available at the time of that design for the remote vision system, it was, I'll say, you know, 2007 camera technology. And so I, I kind of looked a little bit of it up. It, it corresponds roughly to the iPhone 4. Uh, which had a fantastic three megapixel, I'm sorry, five megapixel camera. 
and a 0.3 megapixel front camera, right? And that was more advanced than the technology available when they designed the vision system. And so should we have been surprised that in 2020, we had to redesign that system to take on modern sensors? And should we have resourced for that, knowing that the, 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 the act of creating a, a, a stable design takes a while, but then you have to create the opportunity to go then and integrate that new technology, which I thought was, was something we don't typically do because the whole institution pushes us away from acknowledging that reality. And even if you don't do it, you still have diminishing sources of supply on the old stuff that industry is not even making anymore. Right, so you're going to do one or the other. You're either going to modernize with new technology, or you're going to face obsolescence that's going to cost you money anyway. And as a department, I think we ought to move on to the new stuff. So I know I've probably gone a little bit over time. Uh, those are some of the challenges I think that that have come into play. And I'll turn it over to uh, to uh, to to uh, the admiral here for uh, his opening remarks. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Dave. So it's a privilege to be here. Uh, thank uh, NPS uh, for putting this on uh, for as many years as you have. It is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, we'll comment on that here uh, later, I think, as to some of the advantages of it. Uh, my friend, my test pilot school uh, classmate, Ray Jones, thanks for the invite and for all that you do to, uh, to help educate the uh, up and coming acquisition side. Dave, it's probably okay that uh, you didn't know I was a pilot. Uh, I was... Uh, I've been, uh, if you read my bio, I was ship handler of the year and I was program manager of the year, but I was never pilot of the year of anything. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm like the happy Gilmore of aviation, right? You know, yeah, I'm a hockey player, maybe not, maybe not. So uh, that's all right. The, uh, but I do come with a nine word Pentagon title, two of which of those words has deputy and assistant in it. So it is, uh, that means that I don't get out much. And it is, uh, it is certainly nice to be here on the West Coast uh, and with all of you. And it's awfully nice. Uh, I love coming uh, uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast. You pop awake at 4 a.m. and uh, you've already got emails in your inbox. You knock those out. You work out. You go for a run along the beach. Uh, you do some more emails and then you're ready to go for the day. So it's, if you could only be that productive every day, it's uh, wonderful. Just keep heading West every day, I guess on that. And then I guess the last thing I'll say from a credibility standpoint, since we're talking aviation, I do come from the service that gave us Top Gun 1 and Top Gun 2. Uh, Dave, of course, comes from the service that gave us Firebirds. And uh, and then before the Air Force guys laugh too loud, uh, they come, they gave us uh, Iron Eagle 1 through 6. So... <laughs> So hopefully that'll add to some credibility. Uh, uh, we also gave you 12 strong because we were actually involved in the fight. That was good. That was a good move. There you go. Uh, <laughs> you're saying Top Gun wasn't realistic? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm saying I, I don't like Tom Cruise. <laughs> okay. So uh, to pick up on a couple of themes here, um, you know, so, so everybody knows this. This is... It, it, I mean, we're in a different environment now, right? So, you know, six, seven years ago, it wasn't like there was a decision meeting, but the national security establishment of the U.S. kind of flipped over. We recognized China wasn't going to play ball in the Western liberal democracy of the, of the world since World War II, uh, that uh, they had closed the gap, uh, whether militarily or uh, in the commercial sphere. Uh, we had a real uh, competitor again, and the uh, atypical era of history where we did not have, we were a sole superpower, non-existential threat in the world was closing. And so we're just in a different era. And so that means that reflects change. That requires us to do things different. It requires us to think, act, and operate uh, differently. You are seeing that oftentimes in the um, in the meaning of speed, sense of urgency, getting capability. So you're hearing these common themes, but but remember that from a perspective of more that it's not like what everybody did was wrong or everything is busted or something. It's just that we have to adapt because we're in a new situation with new priorities, a different risk base, uh, a different level of technology that allows the insertion of capability faster. Uh, and so we have to change, right? So uh, I think that's always uh, important to kind of uh, think about. Uh, also, to, to Michael's opening comments on the standpoint of uh, it's not broken, I tend to, when I talk to the acquisition workforce or others, uh, I tend to try to remind them, okay, look, 
we've got a lot of things, a lot of problems, a lot of things to get better on in a changing environment, as I said, that's going to require us to do things differently. Uh, but let's not lose sight that uh, we actually do get stuff done, right? So for the Department of the Navy, as an example, uh, last fiscal year, $123 billion. The statistics would be similar to uh, all the services, $123 billion uh, obligated. Okay, that was pretty much most of the acquisition uh, procurement R&D uh, budget that was uh, provided uh, by the taxpayers. That represented over 230,000 contract actions in order to do that. Uh, over 18,000 different prime contractors that we dealt with in order to make that happen. Uh, over $50 billion of that was competed, and 19.6% of that went to small businesses. Okay, so uh, we actually do get stuff done. We actually do get stuff on contract, and we actually do deliver, right? So that's an important prospect. Start with the good. Now we dive into, you know, where we need to get better. So uh, I'll just set, oh, and, you know, another thing I guess worth noting, too, that may give you confidence in our collective ability to react and change. Just think about how we came through the defense industrial base during COVID. When we went into that, I'm sitting there going, oh my, and I'm sure Michael, you were, and, and everybody going, this is going to be catastrophic. We're going to shut down production. I mean, how are we going to keep the shipyards open? How are we going to keep an airport, aircraft line open? How's this going to happen? We're sending everybody home and we have no idea when this is going to be. And the vaccine could be years and years off. Uh, we, we were pretty creative and got through that. The collective defense industrial base, U.S. industry, uh, government flowing dollars to keep things moving, uh, the, the procedures that were set up on production lines, the adaptation that was required when there was a breakout to isolate, uh, something completely unexpected, the, the, the typical black swan event. Uh, we reacted as a nation and we kept things flowing pretty darn efficiently uh, on that. So use that as a, a sign of confidence as we take on these bigger challenges. So let me just frame, uh, I think, um, just a, maybe three areas that I think we might get into in the questions or the discussions uh, or questions that come about uh, on there that I think are areas we certainly uh, need to focus on. One would be, uh, and it's been talked about, more rapid uh, insertion of uh, developing technologies, right? Um, they're 75%, uh, you know, we flipped again, the world has changed and uh, the majority of the uh, driving technologies that we need to advance our operational capabilities and solve our operational problems are, are being led in the commercial sphere and not the government labs anymore. That requires a different approach, a different ability to bring that capability in. And of course, we've got the, the you know, the sense of urgency of the uh, decisive decade, uh, that we're dealing with, and we have the ability to insert this technology if we use it right. So that's that's an area that uh, we need to focus on uh, pretty heavily. Uh, defense industrial base expansion would be the second, right? If you think about it, none of us really uh, have have been professionals when we've had a defense industrial base expansion. Now, there have been there are some isolated cases, particularly in the 2000s on the land side, you know, MRAPs, things like that. So there are lessons to draw from in our recent experience, but not many. The large majority of us have been in a contraction for most of our professional lives. So that, and we are, and we're not going to expand the entire defense industrial base, but there are going to be areas uh, that we are going to expand. For the Navy, well, for everybody, munitions is first and foremost, right, and uh, staring us in the face. Uh, we can talk about that. Um, for the Navy, certainly submarine industrial base is another one where we've got a big, big hill. And it, it's they are similar stories for the other services. And then the third one uh, that I would offer, we might discuss is the uh, uh, what I refer to as bending the curve with respect to the cost and time of development. Uh, we have uh, been uh, victims uh, for uh, for many years, uh, for decades, the whole world, really, with the increasing complexity of the stuff that we design and build. Uh, and uh, we can talk about the systems engineering model and what digital now brings to us to be able to potentially uh, bend that curve. So I, that would be uh, three areas that uh, I would suggest that we're certainly putting focus on that is right uh, and proper for us to 
incorporate for the times that we are now facing. And I look forward to the discussion. So thanks to both of you for your opening comments. I, I, I think you touched upon three themes that I wanna make sure that um, we'll kind of follow the line of questioning. So one, speed, uh, the second, the innovation piece that you just talked about. And uh, I'm going to add one here about the collaboration between uh, the department, the requirements, and um, the in industry partners. So let's start with speed. Uh, General Bassett, I'll start with, with you. So the department is focused on the delivery of integrated capabilities. And how do you get those integrated capabilities to the warfighter quickly, but also at scale? We heard, we heard some discussion earlier this morning about rapid prototyping. So I, I'm, I'm putting the emphasis here on the, on the scale. What are your thoughts on steps that we should take um, as a nation to affect that? When I, when I look back on programs that we've delivered really quickly, and there's been a few, um, and again, quickly is re relative, right? Depending on what it is you're going off to go buy. Um, I, I think you have to keep an eye on the, the actual activities to deliver it, right? The fastest thing to deliver is something that's already being manufactured, right? So a lot of folks look back to say the Army Striker program as an example of a very rapid program. And there's this myth about it that says we designed it, built it and fielded it in three years. Anybody heard that myth? It's not untrue. What's untrue about it is, is that it was, it was already designed and it was already in production in Canada. And they just had to kind of agree on a set of requirements that roughly described the system that was already being manufactured, right? So, so when you go back to the activities, you go back to design, build, test, field, um, sometimes the fastest way to get something is to agree to buy something that's already been designed. Uh, so, so I think that's something we got to keep in mind. Uh, I, I liken it to, to uh, climbing a mountain. Uh, the fastest mountains to climb have roads to the top, so you better pick one with a road. <laughs> but if you pick one that's got cliffs that nobody's ever scaled before, you better be prepared for some prep and some time, and it's going to take a little while longer. Um, so, so that, you know, uh, the other example there is, is the Army's light tank program that's now in low rate production. Uh, when we envisioned that program, we had an active and meaningful dialogue with our user around requirements that was informed by the timeline for manufacturing. So when the chief of staff of the Army said, I want it now and schedule is most important, we went back and said, well, let's see what's in production. Let's see what designs are stable for both a chassis and a turret so that you have a chance of meeting a, an aggressive timeline. Because what was driving it wasn't the bureaucracy. It was the fact that there were no light tanks being manufactured anywhere in the world. And we knew that just the lead time on the gun tube was probably 16 months, right? And so the only way you bought that down was, was, was making some decisions, constraining requirements to what could be rapidly manufactured, and then pushing that program at at a much faster pace than had we, uh, I'll say, allowed for uh, uh, any, any breadth of what the requirements could have been that would have driven more design time, more technology development, and certainly more cost. So those big decisions up front have probably the most dramatic impact on, on speed. So, so, you know, Admiral, a little bit different environment, much longer lead on ships and aircraft. Any additional thoughts? Uh, I'll give you two. Um, one, and, and Dave kind of touched on it, uh, certainly the, you need to understand how big, of a, how big of a leap you're going to take, right? If you look at programs, program success, program schedule to delivery, uh, technical risk tends to be a big element of that, right? So sometimes you have to take that big, that big step function leap in technology. But uh, that evolutionary development uh, plan is, uh, is certainly has a lower risk bar and certainly historically proves out to deliver capability in a more predictable fashion. Um, you know, on, on the airplane side, you can take, well, I'll give you an airplane and a, and a ship uh, side of it uh, where we've started to maybe bend the curve of just everything new, right? So the F-18 example, right, that family of airplanes where it's been evolutionary development, F-18, the Super Hornet, okay, well, we're going to take the same avionics, build a slightly bigger airplane, improve a few things, build some more capacity for the long term, but that was controlled technical risk, and then insert the, the better, the radar, the ACER radar, the advanced EW suite as those things develop, right? 
classic evolutionary development. And then we repeated that with the growler, take all the stuff that works on the prowler and throw it on the super hornet that already works and just make it an integration program. And then in parallel, let's develop all the new EW stuff and we'll insert that when it's ready. So that has been a very productive model for the Navy. DDG 51 on the ship side is another great example, perhaps, where we said, you know what, the hole's good for a while. This is a decision, you know, years back. The hole's good for quite a while. We don't need to design a new ship, a new hole, et cetera. Let's just keep putting capability and advancing the capability on that. And we've been able in our, you know, our uh, flight three uh, DDGs just gone to sea for the first couple of times here in the last, uh, the summer, so, or spring. So, uh, so, so that's one attack. Dave mentioned it, you know, understand what you're biting off. Let me give you one moving forward though, uh, perhaps that we'll, that we're all wrestling with some munitions. Um, not only in capacity, but also perhaps in compressing the timeline. It was, it was funny at the Navy has fleet sync. We get our six Navy four stars together and some of the three stars and, and, you know, talk about the big problems and needs. And during that, Hey, we need, you know, munitions now right we all took we've taken risk in it for decades it's uh we, we've known that it's been a budget balancer ukraine has just shined a spotlight on this and caused the discussion to occur at the building and the discussion typically as it gets up to the highest level goes something like this oh wow we're out of those missiles uh build some more of those um well uh, that's going to be you know four, five, six years. Well, what do you mean it's going to be four, five, six years? Just build some more. Well, we stopped building them. The production line's been shut down three years ago. Or, uh, you know, we've been building at min rate. There's no additional capacity. There's, you know, the and suddenly, so the awareness of the problem's gone up. Okay, great. Um, that is now a priority. So we got, I got asked at Fleet Sync, uh, why does it take two years to build a missile? Uh, and tell us what you're going to do about it, right? So, we came back, I came back to him and said, well, this is why it takes two years to build a missile. It actually takes four years. Uh, <laughs> so because we have this idea, I need more missiles. And then we spend two years in the budget process. I think I'm going to buy them. No, you're not going to buy them. I think I'm going to buy them. No, you're not going to buy them. You know, that is not a signal to industry to do anything. Uh, and then finally, after the two years, we, okay, we're going to buy X number. Well, because it's been low rate, because it's not consistent, because it's not ramping up, there is no advanced work here. Uh, industry is not, uh, now industry starts from a standing stop, basically, at that point in time, starts the long lead contracting, uh, that gets done, those long leads, things start going, we, you know, there's a whole tier all the way down the supply chain as that gets ramped up. When you finally get all that stuff together at the final assembly plan, it takes about six weeks or so to put the missile together, right? So there's your trade space. Uh, let's, we've got to compress that time. So we've kind of put together, you know, the path of, um, and I'm almost done here. It's going to be an exponential journey, right? So you can't change this thing overnight. It's not going to be a step function, but you got to do, you know, specific steps now in sequence to start to build the business case and to change the behavior. So that starts early, right? It starts with the investment for one. So you're seeing $2 billion more in the Navy budget, similar to the other services and in, in weapons. It takes a commitment longer term. So Navy's got four multi-year procurements uh, in 24 that, we, that we're going to uh, land uh, on munitions, right? Uh, there's large lot procurement direction uh, that came in the, uh, in, in the uh, defense bill. Uh, there's uh, some uh, authorities given uh, in Congress. Now we're looking at together where are the long lead components that are most critical that we can invest in either by U.S., by government or industry in order to start compressing that timeline. You start doing this over and over, you start building that business case to where now industry's motivated and it's a and it makes good sense to buy ahead of need to have those components on hand and now you start compressing as well as potentially capacity so that's a challenge. no thanks for that I'm, and by the way as a guy who had to build missiles just hearing you say that and that understanding i think is already a step forward did you have any thoughts i'll Tom? just add to that too he's not talking about designing a new missile Yes. He's simply talking about manufacturing more of something that we already have. Uh, and it really does come down to how cold is your supply chain. 
right? How cold is your supply chain? How gone is the tooling? How many employees are left that have ever made it before? This is a human endeavor. Uh, the other thing I'll caution against, and I'll, I'll use an aircraft analogy because I know that'll make you happy. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's, a, there's also a, a story out there that says that the B-21, which uh, I'll, I'll say Northrop's done a wonderful job getting into low rate production, that that story is a story about, the con about conquering bureaucracy. They got the bureaucracy out of the way and they were able to go fast to deliver the B-21. That's not a true story, right? If you actually go back to the folks that, that had done it, that were involved in the decision-making, it's really, I think, about solid acquisition fundamentals. They didn't chase requirements they couldn't catch. They leveraged elements of the B2 design. They didn't stretch for technology that was immature. They stay focused on meaningful systems engineering, design, and manufacturing. And they, and they did it in a time of, of, of great uncertainty in, in, in uh, the economy and in, in manufacturing writ large. It was a well-executed program. But the idea that somehow the secret to success was doing it without any supervision or oversight, I think is really misleading as to what caused that program to be successful and undervalues the really solid acquisition fundamentals that went into making that program a success. And it started at contract award. It started at a time where there was, uh, there was this guy that was in charge of Air Force acquisition. Oh, it was Dr. LaPlante that was involved in that all the way back at the previous contract award. And when you can have a program that's born healthy, you don't mind a little more oversight because you're, you're overseeing a solidly, fundamentally sound program. Let me switch directions on you just a little bit. Uh, Admiral, I'll start with you. So uh, daily, I'll hear about more use of commercial technology that'll speed up the process and everything will be better. I don't mean to ask the question in a pejorative way. I'm, I'm asking, what are your thoughts as you look at across the spectrum on com commercial technology? Yeah, this has been this has been kind of a fun area for me uh, diving into because uh, some of it's new, 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 new to all of us, right? I mean, uh, talking with private equity, venture capitalists, trying to understand how we make connections with those uh, again because the majority of the leading technology development is happening in the commercial space now, so we have to adapt and change and figure out how to how to bring that in and bring it in faster so this has been a you know learning experience for me so by by no means am do i have all the answers here but uh during this i've kind of uh there, there, there are many challenges but there are three kind of key structural challenges to our system i think that we have that that we're all collectively trying to address here uh, so bear with me here so one is that we're really not structurally motivated. No one's motivated by existential need or you know their fit rep bullet or whatever it is that motivates you in government to to make those transitions, right? I mean, we've got our S and T folks, uh, we've got our labs, we've got our warfare centers. They don't not want it to transition. They're not going home kicking their dog at night, right? They're good people doing good stuff, but their life's going to continue. Uh, as long as they continue to get funding and work and develop these things, right? And then you got the program side and our R&D is going to fix the stuff we're supposed to field and, and final develop and it's behind and it's not quite there yet. And there's always a, an area to do that. And there's really nobody that's sitting there trying to, trying to grab this stuff over, right? Uh, I mean, we have some mechanisms, SIBRs, phases, and program sponsors and things like that. So we've got a few band-aids in there, but but nothing just basic into the structure. So that's that's one area. And you're seeing um, what you're seeing now are organizations that are springing up in order to try to fill that gap, right? So whether that's AFWORKS on the Air Force or the unmanned task force that the Navy's played with, uh, Naval X, you know, trying to reach out and touch uh, commercial spheres uh, on these uh, the Office of Strategic Capital now trying to make these ties and, and influence some of that effort with some money seeding uh, on that. The, you, you can see that that learning trying to scale and figure out how to how to do that, right? So that that's one area. Uh, the second one is that, again, um, a lot of these emerging technologies are going to drive a difference. These are these are ends up these are going to be inserted at the tier four, tier four supply level, right? So we in the government are probably not going to 
contract for an AI algorithm, right? We're going to contract for an airplane that has a mission computer that ha does a capability that requires that AI algorithm. So, you know, we have to ensure that our ability to inject that not only is direct with us, but also through our primes or subprimes, et cetera, and that, that those paths are clear and that we're setting the stage to, to encourage that and everything. So that's the second area. And then the third one's the money one, right? So we're not typically structured to where when we do find those connections. So by the way, those organizations I mentioned that are standing up, what they're doing is they're taking a group of people that have it, it's it's a collective of both technology acquisition and and operational folks, and they're doing the the hard work that an actual startup typically does in the in the commercial sphere, where they are learning what the technology is that's available, that's mature, that's ready to transition. Then they're running out and talking to the operation commands and figuring out what the operational problems they need, and they're making those connections right. Nobody does that as a full-time job except for these kind of things set up now. But then when they do find the connection, okay, well, I'll palm for that, right? I mean, so so what we're finding, again, in the AFWorks example, we've done it a little, at a lower scale with unmanned task force on the Navy side is trying to find ways to bring money in immediately, whether that's diverting it or a fund or silver dollars that you can convert or whatever, uh, in order to continue to move that along while you palm for it so that it develops and it goes, which also then becomes an encouragement for those commercial firms to not just go dual use commercial, but actually see that we're on a path of scale if they stay military. So yeah, thank you. Hey, General, can I just ask you the same question, but you know, you've worn a couple of different hats as a program manager, but also having a lens from the contract side. Any thoughts? Sure. Uh, one of the ways we tried to get after, I think, what uh, Spanky just described, which is this difficulty of, of palming for emerging commercial technology, was in the network side for the Army. That was something we supported in the capability set model. Uh, model that we were we were pursuing because it allowed us in the palm to to palm for a certain number of brigade sets of capability with with what amounts to a wedge for commercial technology that we wouldn't decide what we were going to get until we had finalized the design of that capability set so it did allow for some on ramps for some commercial radios and other things without knowing two years earlier exactly what it was going to be and that's a, i think a conversation with congress as well because it takes a certain level of trust to say we're going to allow you to to palm for dollars for commercial insertions that you're not 100% sure what it's going to be yet or which district it'll be built in. And that kind of uncertainty, right? It's a uh, flexible funding. Uh, it, and, and a lot of, you know, when we had first started having this discussion, uh, I thought flexibility was the, the new F word in the committees. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think they've now, I think, gotten a little more comfortable with that idea that, that we can plan for commercial technology insertion. I'll say from the contracting side, um, we have a lot of dialogue with industry around what commerciality really means and then how that commercial technology gets applied when we go contract for it. I love commercial contracting, but I really like it when I know I'm actually paying a fair and reasonable price because the commercial market has set the price for that item. And frequently, that's not really what we're talking about. And so I do see some companies try to use commerciality, particularly on something that they know I have to buy from them as a, as a way of expanding margins rather than speeding the, the award of contracts. So we're happy to pay commercial prices for genuine commercial items. But when we get into this sort of as a type commercial, um, we want to be confident that the level of modifications and the cost of those things still represents good value to the government. And uh, I would just encourage all the industry partners that commerciality should be a way of speeding contract award for the things the department needs, not as a way of demanding outsized margins that they would otherwise experience only in a commercial marketplace. So I want to make sure we leave some time for questions from the audience. So I'm going to ask you just one more question and, and hopefully get you to opine on um, maybe your thoughts on how we can increase collaboration between the department, the requirements community, um, the program management side, and industry. I any thoughts in those areas? And uh, I'll start with you, Admiral. Yeah, so uh, I guess a couple things. One is uh, understand your business, 
understand the perspective of the other guy. Okay. The, and one of the best definitions of strategic thought is, uh, is to understand the perspective from all the angles. Okay. Uh, so understand that and then talk. All right. Don't be afraid to talk. I know the lawyers are going to tell you, uh, if you talk to them, you're going to have to talk to everybody. Well, great. Talk to everybody. You know what? My schedule to date still hasn't been overloaded by the fact that uh, I talked to one company that's, I got 78 that want to talk to me now. I, the ones that want to talk to you, talk to you, right? Talk. All right. I've never seen a protest that's been held up because, uh, oh, the PM talked to me, you know, talked to them, didn't talk, you know, so talk, 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 be there. But you got to you, you got to know your business, right? And you got to understand your perspective and what you need to deliver and what your responsibilities are. And then you got to understand what industries or the requirements officer or the fleet commander or what have you, what their perspective is on that. Um, and then you then you build credibility. OK, and then when you build credibility, what you end up finding out is you're, you're about 85 percent common space there with common objectives. And now on that 15 percent where you've got fundamental organizational disagreements, you can have a productive conversation and resolve those or just choose to elevate the folks uh, on both organizations hired to help solve it. So um, know your business, understand their perspective. Don't be afraid. Talk, build credibility, solve problems together. I, I really want to build on on what uh, Emma Morley just said about not being afraid to talk to industry. You know, you hear these stories about constructive changes, and and you know, you got you got a whole generation, I think, of of acquisition leaders that are a little too afraid to talk to industry. There's really only one time when you shouldn't be talking to industry, and that's when you have an active RFP out on the street, uh, or like in the middle of a protest, right? But outside of that, you should be talking to them. You should be helping, especially when you're starting to set requirements. And you got to remember that no company ever was awarded a contract for telling the government they couldn't do something, right? They're, 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 they're predisposed to telling you what you want to hear. So you really have to ask questions in a way that allows them to provide meaning fee meaningful feedback to you without making it appear as if they're going to be non-responsive to some future RFP. And so you got to spend some time developing those relationships, getting that honest feedback, uh, having that dialogue with them. Uh, you need to understand how much process you're asking for to industry to provide. What are your procedurals going to cost industry to deliver? Uh, how could those be streamlined so that you're not paying for so much process and not as much product? You need to have that dialogue with a broad enough cross-section of industry that you're actually getting meaningful feedback. Because if you if the first time you get that feedback is when the RFP is out on the street, don't expect to get a lot of candor in return because now they yeah. need to tell you yes in order to be responsive to that contract. And uh, and and you don't want to pick the best liar, right? You've asked them for something impossible. None of them want to tell you no. And you end up picking the person that tells you best what you want to hear, but it's not what you need to hear. So that dialogue with industry is absolutely critical. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to ask Dr. Mortlock if there's any questions from the audience. There is. And uh, the first question has to do with uh, jointness uh, and joint programs and the movement toward joint interoperability. Could you comment on um, the movement toward joint interoperability and what that does to competition then with industry for joint programs? I think the three of us have all had joint in our name at some point, but I'm going to I'm going to start with uh, the Admiral. Okay. All right, so uh, it ebbs and flows, right? So uh, we have, uh, <laughs> you know, we have a good experience. We think it's a great idea. We have a bad experience. We, we're, we're a little shy of it. We're a little shy right now, I think, coming off the F-35 experience of the complications of a, a massive joint program office like that. There are other joint program offices that work great. Um, so there's, there's examples both ways, right? So it, it ebbs and flows and it depends on, which, which, again, it, it kind of gets to the, uh, you know, um, uh, as, as uh, talked about by Mr. Gerton and the acquisitions pathway, you got to choose the right path and the right model for what you need to get done, right? And then you need to execute it well. The, uh, but there are other tools for this too, right? So there are lots of examples that are extremely productive that are um, lead follow uh, or cooperative uh, efforts. I'll give you a, a, just a couple of examples. So for uh, the longest time, uh, the Air Force and the Navy on the aviation side, you know, 
in, in the international uh, space or even on the domestic space. Uh, on, on missiles, we lead some development of missiles. Uh, the Air Force leads other developments of missiles. So we have a seat at the table. It's different budgets uh, that feed in, but you've got a single service that's the, uh, that's the MDA and the SAE and all that stuff. That works pretty good uh, there. The, uh, and then when we represent internationally, we sign one case with a lead uh, platform service, but then we're supporting elements that come in with the other stuff that goes onto that airplane. So that's a decent model that goes on the, on the Navy Army side, um, a name familiar to some of you, Lieutenant General Thorogood, who just retired. I think he might be speaking uh, here, right? Or may even be here. I don't know. But uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, he was a pain in the ass, but he... Uh, he moved, he moved the needle a little bit, right? So he did some pretty innovative, creative stuff as the Army is looking to get, uh, you know, shore-based, land-based uh, maritime effects uh, of, and we need it now in the decisive decade. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's not start from scratch. The Navy's got maritime attack weapons. Let's use those and do that. And so the Army played off of existing programs that we had and we even built them into our contracts and took stuff off of our already production line uh, runs in order to get them so they could integrate test and field. So those are a couple of examples where we can work jointly. David, any quick thoughts? Well, I, I think, I think uh, you really nailed it. Uh, we, we work best as a joint force when we're solving common problems. And so as Secretary Girton mentioned earlier, the, the idea of, uh, I, I think I might have just gotten ahead of confirmation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sir, nice to see you. Um, but <laughs> director, director, right. Director. By the way, I also have a one-word job title, not nine. Yeah. Um, but, but when when we're solving common problems, uh, it gives, and, and I think that comes down to mission threads or mission webs, where you're able to say this is the operational effect I want to achieve across the joint force, and then you can distill it down to the set of things that must interoperate and where data must be passed to achieve, particularly to achieve that lethality effect on the battlefield. And, and then, you know, I, there, I, I chaired a panel yesterday with a paper that talked about the decision that countries make when they have to decide if they're going to make something, buy something, or collaborate. And I think in the department, we've looked at that as part of an analysis of alternatives, but frequently every service still wants the control that goes with their own solution. And so I, I know the Army's not always the greatest at that. You know, we spell joint A-R-M-Y, but, <laughs> but, but I do think there's got to be some give on everybody's part to end up with common solutions. Uh, having looked at tactical networks for a lot of years now, I mean, there are, there are dedicated platforms which fly simply to, to transform data links in the air because it's too expensive to crack open platforms that don't interoperate, right? That, that there's a lot of money being spent just on that. So wouldn't it be better if we worked on that before we actually provision those things in the aircraft, right? And then got those things synchronized. But it works best when you're saying, okay, I got this effect and this, you know, I got the sensor and this shooter, and then I can walk through all the joint systems that have to talk and let's go make that happen. It may not even be a new program. It may be a set of features to existing programs. Uh, and, and having that common problem that we're trying to solve, I think, goes a long way. We have time for. You have. Uh, yes, we have time for one more question and uh, and then your closing remarks. So given that the DOD starts major acquisition programs fairly infrequently, can you discuss some thoughts about keeping the workforce trained and ready and capable uh, to deal with future really complex systems that will need to fill capability gaps? Dave, why don't you start this one? Um, it's, a, it's a real problem. Uh, and so for a lot of acquisition professionals, the first time that they show up at a defense acquisition board for a major program, no matter how senior they are, it may be their first time taking that scale of a program through that milestone. And so uh, I think we have to make sure that we're learning from one another. I think forums like this are incredibly important. Yeah, I don't have a magic solution. It's something we have to watch constantly. Uh, there's a little bit of ebb and flow in the, uh, you know, and, and if you look historically, uh, we we go through cycles of, uh, we have some acquisition disasters where uh, we, uh, it was highly government run with a large government workforce. There's an opportunity to, you know, they want to constrict budgets and dollars. And so, hey, why do we have all this? Let's just get a contract with industry and and let industry do it. They're the professionals on this. And then we, 
we do that for about 10 years, have another couple of acquisition disasters and go, why weren't we didn't, why were we surprised? Why weren't we there? And then we start trying to build the force up. So it's our jobs as the professionals uh, to Dave's kind of opening marks there, really, we've got to try to smooth those edges, if you will, as those, you know, the, that reactionary, that's just part of human nature and part of the government that comes in, we've got to be the informed uh, advisor uh, as to the importance, why why certain government labs need to be there, why government involvement needs to be the right amount, not too much. Um, uh, I'm not trying to just protect my rice bowl, but there's a critical need uh, in order, and here's the reasons why, and here's the examples that happen if that doesn't happen. So we've got to smooth those edges. We've got to continue to educate folks. And then you've got to look at the particular industries where it's it's acutely challenged, right? So uh, two examples, uh, aviation wise, we're, we're in a normal on the Navy side, at least we're in this normal cycle where we've, we, we had like 25 open production lines. We're down to about three or four now. Right. I mean, cause we reconstituted Naval aviation. Um, that's a set of workflow. The companies are working hard to try to keep some folks. We've got to maintain the, our eye. If we don't do it, no one will an eye on our industrial base so that uh, they're there when we need them, when we start ramping back up in those development production programs for the next evolution on that. And then, of course, for the Navy, shipbuilding is just a huge challenge. I won't get into it, but, but the, the challenge this country has in an area to look at in your particular area is, is that we don't have a large ship commercial shipbuilding industry. It's pretty much on the backs of the Navy and the Navy yards and the Navy funded uh, defense yards. And if we cut a ship or two or don't have it in the budget we have big swings in workforce and we may not get them back uh, and we won't even get into just trying to bring them in the first place the attractiveness of the job the importance of craft labor uh, that we devalued in this country and these type of things so it's a it, it is a key area for this profession to keep an eye on because if not us nobody will okay no thank you so look I started this this morning with what I thought would be a little pithy by talking about the fact that the acquisition system is not broke. I do believe though, that we have a responsibility to constantly look to improve and find where there are opportunities to be more efficient in our ability to deliver capabilities, whether you're wearing a uniform, a DOD civilian, or a member of uh, the industrial base. Uh, we talked about a few things today, speed, we talked about innovation and we talked about collaboration. All uh, I thought were valuable commentary from these two senior uh, outstanding leaders. And if you don't mind, please give me a hand. Please help me give them a hand.